I have caused people's deaths or caused them discomfort through the um, through the influence. I believe it was the influence of that voice or whatever it was. It wasn't a voice in my head, it was a voice in here. And when I would do it afterwards, I would hear like a laughter in my chest. Welcome to Stat, I'm telling you all Medical true crime stories and it gets bizarre Karen Wickham, yeah she used to work in ER And now she's sharing the knowledge, so let's get involved Ay, Funny and scary at the same time Medical mysteries, all facts, she ain't lying <laughs> So tune in to Stat if you dare Cause crazy things can happen anytime, anywhere <laughs> Yeah Hello, hello, hello Everybody out there in podcast land Welcome to Stat Shocking traumas and treatments and I am your host, Karen Wickham, coming to you from beautiful Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Thank you for listening in. Now, that first clip you heard was Elizabeth Wetlawfer ultimately confessing to her crimes, blaming it on God, and saying that she laughed afterwards. Very disturbing, to say the least. So if you gather, this is today's episode starting a little mini-series on Elizabeth Wetlawfer, serial killer nurse. Before I get started, I just want to give a big thank you to some reviews I received on iTunes. Thank you to S. Jacob 73 PC Junkie, and KN172938675303. And I want to give a thank you to Tanya Espana, one of my listeners, an incredible, amazing woman who did the voice and reading of Elizabeth Wetlawfer's creepy poem. Thanks, Tanya. So where do I begin? What comes to mind when you think of a nurse? Caring, compassionate professionalism? Warmth, safety, empathy? Or all of the above? I think that's fair. That is the minimum of the roles and responsibilities to give moral and ethical care. That is a standard that I held myself to and feel that I can safely say the majority of nurses hold themselves to as well. Whether in a hospital, long-term care facility, or in your home, you should feel safe. That, above all, is how you should feel. Comfort and assurance. Being sick or elderly in the need of assistance, you feel vulnerable, scared, and uncertain of your future immediate or long-term. It's the job of a nurse to provide excellent, compassionate care and assure the person that they are safe and that their best interests are paramount. Nurses are in a position of trust and one of the most important positions a person could ever be in. There is no room for ego, negative personal emotions, or complacency. You must not abuse that. You can't even slack. What if this is not the case? What if there is a predator in the shadows or in plain sight? What if that person is a nurse? That's what I'm about to discuss. A predator nurse by the name of Elizabeth Wetlawfer. So, what were these crimes? At the Caressant Care Home in Woodstock, Ontario, Elizabeth Wetlawfer worked as a registered nurse from June 2007 to March 2014. Wetloff confessed to killing seven elderly residents. Inspectors learned that another 180 residents died during her shifts, according to the ministry documents obtained through the Freedom of Information request. Wetloffer's method of killing was a lethal injection of insulin, which can result in many hours of physical distress before the victim dies. So inspectors also searched caressing care files for residents who died within 24 hours of the killer's shifts and found 55 of them. At the Meadow Park Nursing Home in London, Ontario, where Wetlawfer worked for about four months after being fired by Caress and Care, the same investigation was conducted. They discovered that 14 residents died during or shortly after her shifts, including the resident she confessed to killing, Arpad Horvath. Wetlawfer did her killing on her eight-hour evening and night shifts. At night, she was the only registered nurse on site. Was she responsible for any deaths that occurred on or near those shifts? Deaths she didn't confess to? Well, Wetlawfer has denied killing more people. But the striking number of deaths on her shifts is terrifying. 
if not suspicious. Wetlawford confessed to killing eight nursing home residents and assaulting or trying to kill six others. Before I get into the atrocious murders that she committed, I'd like to talk about who she is and if there were any signs in her childhood that gave a glimpse into the cold-hearted killer she would become. Elizabeth Tracy May Wetlawford was born on June 10, 1967, Canada's centennial year, to Doug and Hazel Parker in Woodstock, Ontario. Glenn Hart, a childhood friend of Wetlawford, lived across the street from her and said if you were looking for a way to describe the household, if you think 1950s leave it to beaver sort of image in your head, that's kind of the image that would be portrayed. End of quote. Hart recalled that Wetlawford's parents were very controlling. The Parker household adhered to Christian fundamentalist beliefs. Wetlawford's father, Doug, was an elder in the local church. Hart who came out as gay in the 1980s, said that Doug Parker and other church elders disapproved of his homosexuality. Hart said that soon after coming out, he was asked to leave the church. Quote, Beth's mom was very compliant to her dad. Beth was expected to be the good girl. End of quote. As a child, Wetlawford was shy and awkward and frequently the target of verbal abuse from other kids who would tease her. Here comes Bethy Parker, they would say. When Wetlawford was seven years old, she hatched a plan she thought would alter how other kids treated her. A name change. She said she hated being called Bethy. I'm going to go with Beth with an E at the end. And she decided that was going to be her name from then on. So it was no longer Beth, it was Beth with an E. And that's how she saw herself to become special. The name change was an early example of Wet Lawford trying to impose her will on something. Although, ultimately to little effect. The kids may have started calling her Beth, but pronounced it the same way as before. Bethy. Life in high school for Wetlawford seemed to improve. She got involved into school activities, she was a goalie on the field hockey team, and was in a few school bands. But she exhibited a devious, vindictive side. She once pulled a fire alarm trying to get a boy she didn't like in trouble. Wetlawford was also struggling with her sexuality. She had a crush on a girl in her neighborhood and made sexual advances on her, and this didn't go over well. Wetlawford was a deeply conflicted person, one day repenting for her self-imposed sins and the next trying to validate her true feelings and identity. By grade 13, a sense of futility seemed to be settling in. Wetlawford had originally wanted to study journalism and did so for a year in college. But when it failed to hold her interest, she came up with another career choice, mediation and guidance. She enrolled at London Baptist Bible College in nearby London, Ontario, to get a bachelor's degree in counseling. And the strange thing was that Wetlawford's father also started taking courses there, and he tried to keep a close tab on his daughter. At one point, she was sent home after someone spotted her with a girlfriend at a gay-friendly church. She had to leave the school, and when she came back, she was all like, I'm sorry I sinned. I'm never going to do this again. Just pray for me, okay? At this point, Wetlaufer also agreed to undergo a controversial process known as conversion or reparative therapy, an attempt to set her straight, literally. Some people in her family wanted to un-gay her. Wetlaufer would later lament to her friends that she had little to say on that decision. She talked about how she lived with a lot of depression and a lot of self-loathing and self-doubt. While she eventually graduated from Baptist College with her counseling degree, Wetlawford questioned whether it was the right career choice. She returned to school, enrolled to the three-year nursing program at Conestoga College in Stratford, Ontario. After becoming a licensed Ontario nurse in 1995, Wetlawford bounced around a number of placements in Woodstock. She took a full-time job at a hospital in the town of Geraldton, but returned home shortly after saying that the location was too isolated. She continued to feel conflicted sexually and struggled to live the life she felt that she was supposed to. In 1997, she married Donnie Wetlaufer, a local truck driver she had met at the Baptist Church. The pair moved into a modest white bungalow in Woodstock. During this time, Wetlaufer developed multiple health problems. She sought treatment for borderline personality disorder and drug addiction. Her nursing license was restricted early in her career after she stole hydromorphone an opioid prescribed to reduce severe pain from one of her jobs. 
Wetlaufer overdosed on the narcotic, but survived. Temporarily unable to work, she picked up the odd shifts as a personal support worker in various care homes. Unhappy in her marriage, and unable to deny her attraction to women, she began reaching out to women online. In 2007, her husband discovered one of those relationships had developed into something deeper. Confused and angry about his wife's betrayal, he left her. No longer stuck in a loveless marriage, Wetlaufer pursued a new romance with a woman, and it flourished. They had met online and eventually moved into a two-bedroom apartment Wetlaufer rented across town, eventually becoming engaged. Doug and Hazel Parker have never acknowledged the true nature of that or any of the relationships her daughter had with women. Wetlaufer's mother described them as roommates who were down on their luck. She said her daughter was kind and often offered to help people in need by renting out the spare room. When asked about Donnie Wetlaufer's true reason for leaving their daughter, Hazel Parker said he didn't want a sick wife, a reference to Wetlaufer's psychological problems. Her parents seem also to be in denial of her drug problems, dismissing them as medication mix-ups or stress-related episodes. Wetlaufer continued to live with her girlfriend not far from her parents' home. Money had become tight for Wetlaufer and the partner that she supported, so she took up the job at Crescent Care. And that's where she developed the serious addiction to hydromorphone. Hydromorphone is a medication that is used to relieve moderate to severe pain. And it's a opioid narcotic. And it is very strong and highly addictive. People often abuse hydromorphone because they like the euphoric and relaxing property. More and more of the opioid is needed to maintain the same effect and the withdrawal symptoms are severe. By the time she started at Caressing Care in 2007, Wetlaufer had a dozen years of nursing experience, much of it in the diagnosing of blood sugar problems and injecting insulin when necessary. So insulin, what exactly is insulin? Well, it's a hormone made by the pancreas that allows your body to use sugar from carbohydrates and the food that you eat for energy or to store the glucose for future use. Insulin helps your blood sugar to maintain a level from getting too high or too low. The cells in your body need sugar for energy. However, sugar cannot go into most of your body cells directly. So after you eat food and your blood sugar levels rise, cells in your pancreas are signaled to release insulin into your bloodstream. If you have more sugar than your body needs, insulin helps store the sugar in your liver and releases it when your blood sugar levels are low, like in between meals or during physical activity. Therefore, insulin helps balance out blood sugar levels and keeps them in a normal range. If your body does not produce enough insulin or your cells are resistant to the effects of insulin, you may develop hyperglycemia, which can cause long-term complications if the blood sugar levels stay elevated for a long period of time. So, the absence or insufficient production of insulin or the inability of the body to properly use insulin causes diabetes, which as we know is a chronic incurable disease. And insulin is the treatment for diabetes. So, let's just say if a person is given an overdose of insulin, or in her case, intentionally gave it, the initial symptoms, depending on how much they would give, would be sweating and clamminess of the skin, chills, lightheadedness or dizziness, mild confusion, anxiety or nervousness, shakiness, rapid heartbeat, hunger, irritability, double or blurred vision, and tingling in the lips and around the mouth. And in severe cases, patient would have seizures, unconsciousness, and then death. So if you can imagine giving this medication to the elderly who may have Alzheimer's or dementia or have had a stroke and can't communicate how they're feeling, some of these symptoms may be misinterpreted. So getting back to Wetlaufer's responsibilities, insulin can be given orally, subcutaneously, which is in the skin or the fat, just a little bit of fat under the skin or by syringe, pen, or IV. Insulin pens are really popular and kind of what a lot of people are, most people are using nowadays because they're meant to be safe. Cartridges are inserted into the insulin pen. 
On one end, there is a needle, and on the other is a small plastic dial that determines how much insulin is given. Like many long-term care facilities, Caressing Care did not secure or keep close tabs on its insulin supplies. And a lot of people may wonder why this is allowed to happen. And I'd like to explain in my work experience about that and the delivery of insulin. So first of all, insulin is one of those medications that, yeah, you have to be very careful with. But there's many, many, many medications that are like this. When you're in school, you learn all about this. It's it's part of your education. And in the hospitals, there is a strict protocol to follow. And of course, it's it's given by doctor's orders who tell you exactly how much to give and a parameter to, within to give it if the person's blood sugars are high or low. Again, this is an integral part of your education. And in my case, or where I worked, yes, insulin wasn't locked up, but it was a medication that was always co-signed and double-checked by other nurses. You draw it up with another nurse present. You'd show the patient's chart, what was ordered, agree that this is the correct amount, and sign off so that you would have an extra set of eyes to do that. And that's how it's done safely. And that's how it's done in many, many hospitals and well, long-term care facilities. So in understanding that at a nursing home, there may not be an extra nurse on duty. That just means you have to be extra careful with it. So like I said, there hasn't really been a need to lock up insulin because there are many other drugs that aren't locked up that you need to be very careful in giving and you grab another nurse or you, it's also understood with medication or it's the expectation that you check your medications three times. Right patient, right orders, right medication. So that's my little spiel on on insulin. And it is safe in the right hands. Like I said, probably 99% of nurses out there. Of course, this was not the case with Elizabeth Wetlawford. She started experimenting with insulin experimenting to find out how much was needed to kill somebody. She would later describe it as dialing up the process of using the pen to release massive amounts of the drug. She would plug it into a discreet spot in the victim's bodies and the drug would course through their veins, eventually sending them into hypoglycemic shock, a blood sugar level crush. Like I mentioned before, the symptoms of what would happen. Just days after being hired at Caressing Care, Wetlawfer dialed up and stuck the insulin pen into Clotide Adriano, who was 88 years old and suffered from dementia. Adriano survived, but only because other staff at Caressing Care noticed that she was failing and were able to restore her blood sugar levels. Wetlawfer confessed to the police that she didn't really want Adriano to die. Wetlawfer was also experimenting on Adriano's sister-in-law, Albina Demideros. And thank goodness she didn't kill her either. Some of Wetlawfer's victims would stroke out, as Wetlawfer put it. Their bodies would contort and froth at the mouth. Eventually, vital organs would start to shut down and death would be relatively quick, maybe a few hours. Some victims fell into a coma for days before dying. It was three months later when Wetlawfer killed her first patient. I think it's important to talk about Mr. Silcox a little bit because his life was very important, just like all of ours is, and to throw them away because of her discomfort, her anger. Mr. Silcox was only 17 when he enlisted in the Canadian Army, at a time when German troops were marching through continental Europe. He spent more than four years overseas with the Canadian Army Service Corps. At the time, the branch of the military was responsible for the transport and supply of troops. His family said he served in all the main theaters where there were Canadian ground troops in Europe, Sicily, Italian mainland, France, Belgium, and the Netherlands, and he was very proud to have been in Holland when it was liberated. He and his wife raised six children, and he was known as a handyman and a tinkerer. In his eulogy, he was described as a gentleman, a helpmate, a problem solver, a fixer, a builder, a prankster, an animal lover, a true card, a compassionate and loving human being, and a man of deep abiding faith. As his health declined, his family had to place James in a nursing home. Mr. Silcox stayed at Crescent Care Nursing Home in Woodstock. 
He suffered from Alzheimer's disease and had recently had a hip replacement. At this time, I want to play an audio clip of her interrogation in the, at the police station. And it gives you an idea of the kind of person she is. The happy-go-lucky way that she describes everything. Happy-go-lucky at times and, you know, even in unemotional. It's just, uh, yeah, yeah. Just, just have a listen. It's a little bit long, but uh, bear with me or, or fast forward. So Mr. Silcox, um, it says here you're working at double shift uh, from 3 till 7, right? 3 p.m. to 7 a.m. Right. Okay. And this was at Crescent Care? Yes. Okay, in Woodstock? Yes. Okay. And tell me about your, your knowledge of, of James and, and your daily interactions during a shift with him. Um, I didn't see him every time. He wasn't always my patient. I just knew from what uh, people had said that he would grab the, the nurse's uh, breasts and buttocks and he would say horribly inappropriate things about his wife that now he was there, you know, um, he was going to fuck all of us. She was going to fuck all of us, dog, and just would say different things. And he did touch me inappropriately once. And where was that? On, on my breast. breast. On your breast, okay. And were you alone in the room at that point? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, did he have a roommate at all? Did you have a roommate? I, he must have. He wasn't in the same room. So he was either in a double room or a quadruple room. And um, the, the diagnosis of, of his health at, at the time you were caring for him, do you remember? He was post-hip surgery and he had dementia. Do you remember how old he was approximately? No, I don't. I didn't see him in his 80s. In his 80s? Yeah. Okay. And, sorry, he was not a diabetic? Not a diabetic. And, sorry, you said he had dementia? Yeah. Okay, which you've also noted here as well, right? Yeah. Okay. So tell me about the night. Uh, was this the first person that you did this to? That I that I tried. Well, there were other people that I did it to who didn't die. Prior to James. Prior to James. Okay, and he's are they documented on here? He's the first one who died. Right. Uh, Back here. But there's some other people who didn't die. Right. So I can't read that first name. I've read but till they are in. Okay. So that was. I mean, they're both September oh, 2007, but that was yeah. before James. Yeah. Okay. So was this your first attempt at, at overdosing these people on insulin? Yes, Quetzalcoatl was. It was And I didn't really want her to die. Um, so James then, um, it was in the evening that this one took place, right? Yeah. Um, it says here at about 9.30. Yeah. Run me through. About 9.30 I gave him a dose of uh, 50 milligrams of insulin, He's not, not diabetic. So I went into it. I used a borrowed insulin pen, borrowed insulin, and gave him an insulin shot. And at 3:30, the PSO, well, throughout the night he was yelling out, "I love you" and "I'm sorry." And not to not to me, but just you could hear him calling out in his room, and that's what he was calling out. Mm-hmm. And then at 3:30, the uh, PSWs came to me and said that he was gone. So I did what we're supposed to do. I went and listened to his heart and chest. Called the doctor, called the family because that's what they wanted. Family came in to sit with them for a while. Doctor came in and uh, said that his cause of death was from um, an embolism due to his uh, post hip. He'd had a he'd had hip surgery. Doctor ruled an embolism due to post hip surgery. Um, who do you think he was talking to when he was yelling, "I love you"? I thought it might be his, his family. Okay. I really did. And when they came in and talked to me, they wanted to know if he'd said anything. Right. So I told them that I was so ashamed. Yeah. So ashamed. Yeah. When you were speaking with the family. Yeah. Okay. And is that the uh, the family that kind of commended you for the work that you had done? And yes, and that I've been there for them. Yes. How did that make you feel? Awful. Yeah. Absolutely awful. How did you deal with it? Um, I just went home and went to bed. You know, I felt awful. Maybe I fought with my girlfriend. Did some exercising, you know. Yeah. Did some games on the computer and just tried to forget about it. There you have it, folks. She felt so bad that she went home, had a little argument with her girlfriend, played a couple computer games, and went to bed. Yeah. According to court documents... 
Wetlawfer had many problems, but was always able to distinguish right from wrong. Personality testing revealed Wetlawfer exhibited significant symptoms of borderline personality disorder, including mood instability, impulsivity, fear of abandonment, unstable relationships, and anger. Medical records indicate her mental illness and reliance on drugs were documented, but she had been able to function with them for many years. One medical report made note of her mental state. It said, quote, Much of this behavior seemed to have worsened since her husband left in 2007, but this behavior was present prior to her marriage as well. End of quote. In fact, after the age of 15, Wetlawfer had developed what doctors diagnosed as antisocial personality disorder. To complicate things, psychiatrists eventually determined she had difficulties with being brought up in a controlled Baptist home environment. Wetlawfer struggled with her religious beliefs. She was a regular and committed parishioner, but a conflicted one. She seemed less conflicted by now about her sexual identity. It would often go surfing online for love. By early 2008, Wetlawfer's relationship with her fiancé had ended, and she had connected with Sheila Andrews, a prison cafeteria worker in Prince Albert, Saskatchewan. That summer, Andrews invited Wetlawfer out west for a week-long visit. Andrews remembered the nurse strutting off the plane in a summer dress and bright red lipstick and overwhelming her with affection. Not only did Wetlawfer come charging at her for hugs and kisses, but she gushed about their relationship. It was non-stop, said Andrews. Wetlawfer said, Oh, I told all the people I work with how much I love you, and we're going to get together and everything like that. And Andrew said, I was just like, okay, like, slow down here. Let's get to know each other. They spent their first night together in a motel near the Saskatoon airport. When Andrews woke up the next day, she was convinced the relationship was not going to work. Over the next few days, Andrews began to feel there was another more troubling side to her guest. Quote, She pouted a lot and had little temper tantrums, you know, like if she didn't get something her way, like my affection and stuff like that. There was a lot of childish issues with her, and I just thought, you're a grown woman, act like it. End of quote. Despite being a career nurse, Wetlawfer showed no interest in meeting Andrew's elderly mother, who was ailing in the hospital nearby. Wetlawfer did, however, talk about her own medical responsibilities back in Woodstock. Andrew said that, quote, she seemed to be quite proud of being a nurse. I think she liked the fact that she was in charge on the evenings. She enjoyed the power. I think she enjoyed that the most. End of quote. After Andrews rejected her at the end of the week-long visit, Wetlawfer headed home, dejected and bitter. With her latest relationship over, she turned her focus back to work. She began writing graphic poems, posting them online on a site called allpoetry.com under the pen name Betty Watson. And if you go there, you can actually still see these poems. Some were seemingly innocuous. Others were a little darker, like, where am I then? What would they say? Yes, what would they say when the real truth is known, when it is found out what I do alone? That was one poem. But this one here called Inevitable really stands out. Here it is. Inevitable. She watches some life drain from the notch in his neck vein. As it soothingly pools, it smothers her pain. Sweet stiletto so sharp, craves another cut. Obeying a call, she moves to his gut. Blade traces a line from navel to spine, grating on rib bones, slicing intestine. Her knife sings a love song to the splattering gore, slicing through breastbone, romancing some more. Heart beats, then sprays, as this next victim pays her deaf dagger's bill. Does it quench her craze? Sharp thirst recedes as she dances in blood, satiated for now, no longer a flood. The macabre waltz ended, her desire has been tended by drinking the death brew that her passion blended. All others are safe from obsession's greed until she hears again from her knife and her need. By the end of 2011, three more residents at Caress and Care had died unexpectedly. Gladys Millard, 
Helen Matheson, and Mary Zurinitsky. Nothing suspicious was reported to authorities. There were no autopsies. At caressing care, it was up to Wetlawfer to alert authorities if a questionable death occurred on her watch. She was the one who would fill out the checklist, whether or not anything untoward may have caused the residents to die unexpectedly. Essentially, the system allowed her to report her own crimes, which, of course, she didn't do. Even so, there was a constant fear at the back of Wetlawfer's mind of being caught, of losing control of her horrific secrets. On November 7, 2001, the day after killing Mrs. Zerowensky, Wetlawfer flew to Florida with an ex-girlfriend. Although the two had broken up weeks earlier, they had already booked a Caribbean cruise, and neither wanted to miss it. After returning to Canada, they visited Trish Crosby, a friend who lived near Toronto. Crosby recalled that Wetlawfer seemed fine at first, but later started acting very quiet and standoffish. Wetlawfer said she was preoccupied with the recent death of a patient, but wouldn't give many details. Crosby asked, How did this person die? Wetlawfer said, I'm not sure. Wetlawfer was normally overly pushy, trying to get your attention, saying, Look at me, look at me, Crosby said. This time she was very quiet, not wanting to talk to people and almost depressed. Looking back on it now, I wonder if she was reflecting on something she might have done. Dealing with her red surge wasn't the only thing distracting Wetlawfer at work. There was also her drug addiction. Wetlawfer told authorities that she was never high at work, but at least one colleague claimed that she had been found passed out in the basement of Caress and Care on the night shift. By her own admission, hydromorphone was her drug of choice, and she was binging on it several times a month. And one thing I've learned, when someone says they're binging, or you ask them how much they've had, two to three beers usually mean seven to eight beers. Um, binging usually means every day. So she can no longer control the drug. It was controlling her. Hydromorphone is always at hand in the care facility. Caressing Care supposedly kept closer tabs on hydromorphone stocks than on insulin, but Wetlawfer had discovered many more ways to stealing the drug from her patients. There was hydromorphone in their allotted medications, but as Wetlawfer later revealed to police, some of the patients had confusion, so they couldn't tell the difference between what pills you were giving them. Quote, I would give them a laxative instead of hydromorph. End of quote. In other cases, Wetlawfer would open the capsule, swallow the contents, and give the patients an empty pill case. They never complained. She also took the narcotics of the patients who died. In one case, there were 23 hydromorphone pills left in the medication case belonging to a deceased resident. The nurse monitored when new drug supplies arrived. If they weren't put in the safe right away, she would snatch them up and take them home. It often took weeks or months before anyone noticed drugs were missing. When the police phoned about it, Wetlawford later confided to investigators, I played dumb. One of the effects of hydromorphone was that it kept Wetlawford more relaxed at work. Quote, I was always just feeling like I had to be the best person, she later told police. She said that she could get a hold of Hydromorph, one or two or three, and, and take it, and then the pressure was gone. For almost two years, Wetlawford didn't want to kill anymore. But by 2013, the red surge was back. That reason there, the ease of access that a nurse or doctor can have with getting medication, is in my opinion why doctors and nurses are the scariest and the worst type of serial killer out there because it can be hydromorph that's not as easy to take as say digoxin or insulin or potassium those drugs can be stolen or used they figure out that in this case at a nursing home that the patients wouldn't notice that the drug wasn't given to them, except for these poor people were needing this medication for pain, so I'm sure they noticed it, just not able to communicate it, which is a whole other level of, of sickness on her part. So yeah, doctors and nurses can be uh, some of the worst if uh, they go off. On occasion, Wetlawfer's surges of anger 
were followed by equally sharp pains of guilt, or at least the need to lessen the load on her shoulders. At the time Wetlaufer was attending the multi-denominational family church in Woodstock, she said that she drove to her pastor's home and revealed her deadly secrets to him and his wife. They prayed over me, Wetlaufer told police, and they said to me how this was God's grace. But if you ever do this again, we will have to turn you into the police. The pastor, who has never been named by police, later told them he wasn't sure whether to believe her or not. I think if someone confesses, especially to a priest, which is supposed to be kept confidential, that she killed someone, I think that should be taken pretty seriously, even if it might be some sick joke or cry for attention. Just can't overlook this, and it, and it blows my mind that it was. By early 2014, seven patients under Wetlaufer's watch had died, and four others had survived unexplained hypoglycemic episodes. After being suspended four times for making non-insulin-related medication errors that harmed patients, Carescent Care fired Wetlaufer in March of that year. Carescent Care reported her numerous mistakes to College of Nurses of Ontario, the professional organization that oversees nursing practices and conduct. But the college took no known action to sanction Wetlaufer. Her transgressions remain private. So the College of Nurses is like, the College of Physicians. In Ontario, they, they have very strict guidelines on, on everything from procedure and protocol and how we conduct ourselves, uh, safety for the public, all that kind of stuff. Early in my career, I worked as a, as a manager for nurses. And if you fired someone, you had to report to the College of Nurses and then often follow up with some kind of hearing once they looked into what the nurse had done then the College of Nurses is supposed to call in the nurse and, like I said, have a discussion with her, lay out guidelines in what she can do to improve her care, maybe suspend her, maybe take away her license, or maybe have them attend anger management classes or addiction classes or go away for for treatment, that type of thing. But it seems none of this was done here. Nothing was done to protect the public. A provincial public inquiry has since been called into the circumstances of Wetlaufer's case and the oversight of long-term care homes in Ontario. Weeks after being fired by Caressant Care, Wetlaufer was interviewed for a job at Meadow Park Long-Term Care in London, Ontario. The facility needed a nurse to help care for its approximately 120 patients. When asked about her previous termination, Wetlaufer told Meadow Park's nursing supervisor that she had been fired for making medication errors. The supervisor told Wetlaufer she believed in second chances and offered her a one-year contract working evenings. Meadow Park has maintained it checked Wetlaufer's references and her status with the college. Regardless, a month after being hired, Wetlaufer killed again. I think I'm going to stop here today because there's a lot more to talk about. Her arrest, the court case, the outcome, and the effects on the families, and what's going on with Wethlaufer now. Where is she? So it's that time. It is suit your room time. Come on in. Walk up the hallway. You know where to go. That lovely cozy room that by now that you're used to. Oh, you have an order to place, you say? You want some chocolate pudding that's been sitting around for a month but hasn't gone bad? Just like a cheeseburger from McDonald's? Put it in the fridge, you can always eat it a month later. And guess what if you get food poisoning? You are right here with us. You like a cold ginger ale with some of that little chippy ice? No problem, I've got you covered. Here's your pillow. Warm, fluffy, flannel sheets. Put your feet up. (laughs) No, you don't have to take your shoes off. It's okay. We'll wash them. So today's story is actually not going to be about something that happened in the ER. I want to tell a story about when I worked in the community as a supervisor. I would go around and check in on patients to make sure everything was going well with the nursing care or the 
home care that we provided for them. There was this one particular gentleman that I needed to go see. I had gotten a call from a couple of the PSWs that had worked there. These are personal support workers that had been working there and helping him and saying, look, we don't want to go see this patient anymore. You need to go visit him. I was like, okay, all right, no problem. And I'd, I'd ask them, what, what, is the, what is the problem? What's going on? And they'd just say, uh, uh, we just don't want to be there. We just don't want to be there. So, you know, obviously something was up. I was curious as to what was going on. And it was my job to go t- check up on it. We were going through so many staff. The turnover was huge and it was becoming almost impossible to staff him. So I drove to an area of Toronto. It's, it's Scarborough. It's on the outskirts of Toronto. And it's in, in parts, it's a, it's a nice place. And, but in parts, uh, there are some not so nice areas. This particular gentleman lived in a dilapidated building. The elevator was one of those ones that would stop and you had to jump up to get off or jump on it to get in it. <laughs> there was no buzzer on the door when you walked in and there were some scary people hanging out in the in the hallway. So right off the top, I was, you know, alerted to this isn't such a nice place. And I was thinking, oh, maybe it has something to do with this took this scary elevator ride. If it hadn't have been on the like 11th or 12th floor, I probably would have taken the stairs. So anyway, I knock on the door and I, I hear this friendly elder voice say, come on in. So I do and I am stopped in my tracks when I see this elderly gentleman, very pleasant look on his face, a nice little apartment, but he was cleaning a gun. And I said, let's call him Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, what are you doing? Oh, I'm just cleaning my gun, dear. I said, do you have this gun out when your PSWs come? Well, yeah, I I, I need to have it ready in case anything bad were to happen. I said, yeah, I understand that, but you just can't leave a gun sitting out on a table. Is it loaded? Well, Christ sakes, of course it's loaded. Well, I can't spend time loading it if, if someone's already here breaking in. So I said, look, you can't have a loaded gun sitting on top of your table, your, your coffee table, when you have people over to help you. It scares them. And what if something happened? So after a little conversation, he agreed that he would lock it up and put it away when when the staff were there and and I said that I would follow up on it and I had to report this to the CCAC and yeah he was actually pretty good about it and he was harmless I mean I could understand his point this definitely was not a great area of of town and and bad things did happen in the building but yeah that was a shocker to me when I walked through the door and here's this guy cleaning this big old gun and could understand why staff didn't want to go there Anyway, it all turned out okay. Okay, he everybody talked to him. There was a, a meeting, and he locked his his gun up, and uh, we didn't have problem staffing it afterwards. But yeah, I've got some pretty good home care stories. Like I said, I I worked earlier in my career, and uh, I can tell you a few of those for sure. In fact, I've got a really great one that I'm holding back for a special occasion because it is amazing. So stay tuned because I will have that for you in. Well, this month, it might be your little Christmas present. Anyway, thank you so much for listening in today. I hope you come back for the next Elizabeth Wetlawfer episode. And yeah, take care of yourself. Take care of one another. Love each other. And most importantly, love yourself. Peace. One love. True crime and it gets none realer. Sometimes it'll be the cure that'll kill you. Gotta watch out, yeah, you gotta watch your back. Cause you don't wanna be another episode on stat. Thank you for tuning in, learn a thing or two. These medical mysteries can be unbelievable, yeah. Subscribe, make sure you do that so you'll be tuned in and be ready for the next show. Stat.